It's good to be with you tonight. I was asked uh, by Dave to come along and speak about uh, scaling. I uh, assume from the previous comment, and maybe Larry was the one that initiated that. But uh, I think it's it's a topic that's of interest to a lot of people. It's obvious it can be something that's confusing, especially when you get into how you apply it and some of the output that you see as well. So we'll certainly cover that. Um, but overall, it can be quite a powerful tool uh, once you get the hang of it and uh, you can apply it in all sorts of different situations. So let's get into it. If I can figure out how to get out of this screen. Here we go. So just a little bit about me. Dave's obviously covered a little bit by my background. My, my professional background was in software development, worked in the financial uh, industry, in investment management, investment banking left the corporate world about, well, it's actually almost 20 years ago now, and uh, I pursued a path of uh, working for myself and trading my own account, and then developed skills in quantitative analysis, and uh, eventually sort of settled on AMI Broker as my uh, weapon of choice in terms of platform. Um, and since then, I've uh, developed a little bit of expertise in it, I would hope. Um, I do uh, AFL development as a contractor. I offer AMI Broker training. Uh, look me up on AMI Broker courses and you'll find me at uh, helixtrader.com and on Twitter at Helix Trader. So that's a little bit about me. What we'll look at uh, this evening or this morning is what, uh, when and why of scaling. So what, what the hell is it? When, when would we do it and why would we do it? We'll have a look at some practical examples in Ami Brooker's AFL, looking at both scaling in and scaling out using uh, what I would call the regular AFL code. So that's where you design your strategy uh, rules. We'll have a look at how we position size the various scales, both in and out. And we'll have a look at how we then do it in the custom deck back tester and why we would do, even bother doing it in the custom back tester as well. And then we'll cover uh, the big question, which probably a lot of people here uh, want to know to, to begin with is, uh, does it actually work? You know, does it give us better results? Uh, and so we'll cover uh, some of the different approaches and, and w what the um, what the various benefits and drawbacks might be of each. Um, there's plenty of time for q a at the end i'll leave the chat up if you want to drop a question in along the way feel free but there will be time at the end for uh, some questions so the what when and why of scaling so let's have a look into that so uh, what are we really talking about? Let's start off by just defining what scaling is. So with scaling, what we're talking about is we're either increasing or decreasing our position size after we've had the initial trade entry and before we've got the final trade exit. So it all happens within the same trade. We're entering a trade and then you know, on subsequent bars, we're either uh, increasing the position size of that trade or decreasing the position size of that trade until the very final exit. So, um, so the, the the entry and exits uh, don't change, but the position size within the trade does change. So when we're talking about scaling in, we're talking about increasing the size of the position as we go. And when we're talking about scaling out, we're talking about decreasing the uh, size of that position as we go. And we can, you can obviously do a combination of both, or you can interleaf them, scale in, scale out, scale in, scale out. Uh, there's really no limit to, to what you can do other than your imagination. So some examples of when we might use scaling, uh, things like dollar cost averaging. So that's buying uh, as the market's falling to, to get a cheaper average price in the hope that the market will eventually rise and you'll, you'll have a far better entry price than you would have otherwise. Uh, Martingale, which is um, a casino strategy basically, but uh, used by many traders, some in the crazy FX markets as well, where you're basically, you get into a position and if it goes against you, you basically double your bet and then you keep doubling your bet in the hope that when it moves in your favor, then you get out a break even at a far uh, lower price. Um, obviously very, very risky strategy, uh, but it does does have its place in, in, some, um, in some strategies. 
Uh, pyramiding where is where we're talking about increasing our position size as the trade goes in our favor. So if you think about uh, alongside trade, maybe a breakout trade, you put on a small uh, amount of ca um, uh, risk to begin with. And as the uh, trade moves in your favor, you increase the position size as you go. Uh, profit taking is the other side of the coin. That's the scaling out part. So you're to here we're talking about uh, we've we've got a position on, and as the trade goes in our favor, we gradually remove uh, some of the uh, position size as the the trade goes in our favor. So in other words, we're banking the profits and reducing our overall risk as the trade matures. And then the last one is uh, position rebalancing. So that's where you may hold a portfolio of positions, either ETFs or stocks, and you may want to uh, once a month or uh, you know once a quarter, you may want to reset the sizes of all those positions back to some uh, normal, you know, maybe you're holding four positions, you want them to always be 25% each, for example, at the rebalance. So as they move within that period, they'll obviously go out of whack because some will make money, some will lose money. So rebalancing allows you to scale some of the positions that have won out and scale up some of the positions that have lost to get back to that um, same position sizing that you started with. So why would we even bother with scaling? Well, the main reason that most people use it is to manage risk. Uh, so if you think about things like dollar cost averaging, you're you're trying to get a lower risk uh, price that, uh, as you enter a trade. Or if you think of profit taking, it's the same. You know, as the as the trade matures, it's getting further and further away from your exit point. The risk is growing. So if you remove position size, you're going to reduce your overall risk that you've got at the table. Uh, we can also use it to uh, re reduce exposure in extended markets. So again, that's another example of when you might use profit taking if the markets, if you've been in a position a long time, uh, well, just think about the stock markets recently, you know, if you got into positions back in 2020, the markets are now very extended, obviously. And if you've built up a large position in that period, you may be looking to reduce your exposure by just removing some of that position size. We can also build size as our conviction grows. So, so if we think about um, a, a breakout trade, for example, we may have very low conviction of it working initially. So we may only bet a small amount, but then as it moves in our favor, you know, remembering that breakout trades are going to be, you know, forty or fifty percent at best. Uh, um, uh, probability of success. So as the trade goes in our favor, we can add more and more size to that trade, building up our position as it goes into a profitable trade. And obviously that's a form of reinvesting or compounding your profits as you go. So, and all of, all of this, of course, the goal ultimately is to try and um, increase our profits or increase our risk adjusted uh, returns in, in some form or other. Okay, so let's get into the practicalities of it. How uh, Let's have a look at a simple AFL example, and we'll just use a very simple um, uh, example here of, of a, a, a time-based um, strategy where we buy on the first day of the month and each new week, so each Monday, say, we are going to scale our position up and then on the last trading day of the month, we're going to sell our entire position. Okay, so we're going to have... A series of trades one month long and within each trade we're going to be doing some uh, scaling up as well. So we'll have a look at how we structure the AFL code to do that. We'll uh, use our explore functionality so that we can observe the signals within the within the data itself. Then we'll have a look at uh, the output from the back back test trade list and and see how the um, especially particularly things like the scaling column and the entry price column are a couple of things that people tend to get tripped up on so we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time on that and we'll also have a look at the detailed log where you can really get into the the nitty-gritty of what's going on behind the scenes so here's the basic strategy uh, we've got uh, our we're looking for the the, the 
the day we're going to run this at a daily periodicity so so the the day when the the month is not the same as the previous day that's that's your first trading day of the month and then your last trading day we're, we're going to get from this time frame expand function here and the new week we're just going to look at day of the week which is a function that returns a, an integer for days of the week mondays one tuesdays two etc so if the uh, day of the week is less than the previous bars day of the week that tells us we're on the first trading day of the week and then in our buy statement the way that we initiate the scaling uh, we if the if it's a new month we're we're, we're going to enter a position so we can set the buy array to true or one uh, it does just as good and if it's a new week what we're going to do is we're going to um, set the buy array to this special uh, um, identifier within Ami Broker uh, called Sig Scale In, and Sig Scale In is a value that the back tester recognizes as being a, a special uh, value that that uh, gives it, uh, um, it, it gives an instruction to basically scale the position up. And then at the month end, we're going to sell that position. Um, you can see down the bottom here we've got our position size set to ten percent of equity per entry and so what that means is for every entry so that's the initial buy and all the sig scale ins our position size is going to increase by uh, 10 percent so we'll have 10 percent to begin with and then the next week we'll have a 20 percent position the week after 30 percent and so on until we hit the exit and then we'll uh, liquidate the entire position so let's uh, let's switch over to uh, Ami Broker itself and just have a look at this in practice. So here's our strategy that we just had a look at. Uh, we'll just be trading uh, SPY, which is the S and P 500 ETF, and uh, we'll. So we're only going to hold a single position. Max open positions is one, and uh, so you know we can we can have up to. Well, we're never going to have more than about 50% because there's, no, there's, you know, there's really more than five weeks in a month. Uh, so, uh, so let's have a look at what that looks like. If we go to the interface here. So here's my formula. If I run an explore on this, so sorry, just to go back a step, you'll see my explore code down here, which just looks at the buy and the sell arrays. So on the buy side, you can see here on the first trading day of the month, buy is equal to one. So that's our uh, for, that's our initial entry. And then each new week, you can see we're getting these strange looking numbers, which is the value that SIG scale in is, which is, as you can see, 99,998. Uh, so that's what the back tester uses as an instruction to uh, scale the position up. Uh, you can see that because of the way that we've constructed the uh, interactive if statement here, the uh, the initial entry uh, overrides the scaling. So you can see here in this uh, uh, day here where the new month and the new week both fell on the same bar that the it's the new buy that uh, takes precedence. Now, if you if you're not in a position and the back tester receives a six scale in uh value then that's that's the same as an initial entry as far as it's concerned so it will still enter the position regardless of it is a one or an or, or a six scale in uh, but you know if you want to just make your code a little bit cleaner and easier to understand it's better if you separate them out into into two different things because it will be easier for uh, bug fixing and troubleshooting um, down the track uh, so that's that's how that's the format of the signals. So the next thing we can do is now just run uh, a simple back test. So you can see each trade is lasting exactly one month from the first trading day of the month to the last trading day of the month. And over in this column here, scale in, scale out, this is where we can observe what has happened during that month. So the the numbers here as you can see it's scale in forward slash scale out which means that the <clears throat> the numbers to the left of the slash indicate the number of times the position was scaled up and the numbers to the right of the slash indicate the number of times it was scaled down so in this first instance we scaled up three times and if we look at 
March here, we actually scaled up uh, four times, and we can we can go back to the explore and just interrogate that. There's January, and then we've got one, two, three scale ins before our sell signal here, so that's correct. And if we look at March, there's our initial entry, one, two, three, four scale ins before our final exit. So that's all correct. Uh, so that's that's a way to just get an indication of you know how many times that your positions are being scaled and if you're having if you've got scaling that say a price using a price based uh, uh, measure or signal rather than time as we've got here that will give you some indication of you know how much exposure your your uh, your strategy is able to pick up um, along the way you know you may have um, you may allow for say 10 scale ups uh, in your code and if you're only getting two or three because you know because of the way that the price has moved then you you know you you may be you may be uh, overestimating the number the ability to scale that many times and also underestimating how much position that you should be increasing each time so you should always try and bear that in mind you know as we'll have a look uh, later on there's no um there's never a, a free lunch and that you're always going to get um, uh, you, wh whatever it is that you're trying to, whatever is issue or whatever goal that you're trying to achieve by using scaling, the there's always going to be a cost to that. Um, so that might be, so if you're aiming for lower risk, it might be, you know, that you have to end up with lower return or lower exposure and those kinds of things. So. Uh, so just bear that in mind and we'll have a look at that at, uh, a little bit later on. Uh, the other interesting thing to observe here is the prices. And if we have a look here at the, uh, let me just see if I can bring up. Uh, yeah, so if we have a look here at the, here's the first off December where we entered if I put my cursor here on the 1st of December you can see that the the closing price that day and this is the where we're executing at the close was in fact uh, 44752 but here you can see it says 45903 which is nothing like the same thing so what's actually happening here is that as you scale the position you actually get an average price in the uh, in this entry price column so that's something that can trip up uh, you know especially people who are beginning or setting out um, in scaling um, is that these entry prices will not match the prices on your chart because they include uh, an averaging effect that the um, that the back tester applies so that it's basically so that your your change and profit numbers will calculate correctly because you know you've got a certain amount of position at uh you know a given exit price then you need a, a given entry price that's going to make that um, value match um so if we had the if we had the actual initial execution price for the very first entry then the the profit numbers would be out uh, so it it has a logic to it, but it can be confusing if you if you're not aware of it. Uh, but there is a way where you can actually get in and see what's going on behind the scenes, and that's to use the um, uh, the detailed log. So if we open the settings, go to the report tab, and then click on detailed log here, and then if I run the back test again. The detailed log actually shows us what's going on on each bar. So if I go to the first of um, December here, you can see that the price of the entry was in fact at 447.52. So so the entry was correct, but then as it's gone along, you can see here it's entered at another price, and then it's entered at another price, and then it's entered at another price. So all of those prices added together. Um, with the position size of each taken into account will give you an, an overall uh, average price, which is what's displayed in that um, uh, trade list column. So that's that's a very simple example using uh, just scaling up and obviously using a uniform position size. So let's just jump back to the uh, slides for a second. So we had a look at that. We had a look at that uh, strange thing there going on. 
And now we'll, uh, yeah, and we've had a look at the detailed log. <clears throat> so the next thing uh, that usually comes to mind is, well, what would happen if instead of buying all my positions at the same size, I actually varied them? Uh, so we'll have a look at a couple of different uh, examples of that the the first so this is this is the one we've just had a look at where everything's uniform the initial entry and all the scales are all uniform at 10 percent what if we had it that we our initial entry was 50 percent but the scale ends were much smaller only 10 percent each so the way that we would have to <clears throat> excuse me have to structure that is that our position uh, we would build build an array so pause size being a um, you know bar by bar array that looks at uh, the different signals that we've got so if it's an initial entry if by equals one then we'll apply a position size of 50 percent if the um, by array it has a six scale in in it uh, then we'll uh, we'll just apply a position size of 10 and then we can um, set that array in the set position size function. So let's just have a look at that before we move on. Yeah, let's see here. So here is that one. So here you can see uh, now if I just put that in the in the explore part here let's just apply that and explore so now here you can see there's my initial entry position size 50 scale in 10 scale in 10 and so on and now if I run that uh, well let's have a look at the trade list first uh, so the, the outcome of the scaling scaling column will be identical. There should be no change there because it's going to do the same number of scales. Uh, but you'll see that these average prices are now changed. And actually, the, uh, the actual result will also have changed. So if I go back to the first one, and we just... Uh, so here, down here, you can see that my car is 249. And if I go to the, the second one with the variable position size, you can see my car is now 10%. So it's given us a much better result. Well, better in terms of profitability anyway, uh, because we're using that much chunkier initial entry uh, at the outset. So obviously you would want to test different permutations if you are deciding to to use that um, option and if I jump onto the detail log you'll see here the effect of that initial uh, entry being so 50% here give us 137 shares and then our first scale in only give us 27 so that's the the difference between that 50 and that 10% um, so that was a simple variable one. If I go back to the slides now, so let's um, let's get a little bit more fancy here. So what we can do is we can actually <clears throat> base our position uh, size of the scales based on the number of um, the number of scaling signals that we've had since our initial entry. So what we can do is we can scale, uh, sorry, we can set the position size to uh, a decreasing fraction of the actual position size. So this is now something slightly different. We're not going to use a percentage of the equity. We're going to use a percentage of the position. So you can see we're using the two um, string literals here, at percent of equity to set our initial position size. And then we're using a separate set position size function that only applies when it's by SIG scale in. And here we're going to use a percentage of the prevailing position. So after the position has been entered, the next time we get a scale, we look at how much the position is worth and we apply the percentage to that, the, the size of that position. And if we're not in that, if we don't find a bar that's got that SIG scale in, we do nothing. So that's SPS, no change, means that the this initial function, the set position size will, will you know, get, have the, we won't be altering what that's doing to the entry position sizes.
So that may all sound a little bit complicated, but let's have a look at it in practice. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so here we go. Here's our um, functionality here. And so if you just, if you, you'll see here, I've included these now in the, in the explore output so that we can just observe what's going on. We'll have our, um, uh, this, this sum since it just basically counts up the number of six scale ins since the last buy signal. And then we apply uh, 50 divided by that number to give us uh, a fraction that we're going to use. So when when it's the first scale in, it will be 50% of the position. The second scale in will obviously be 25. The third position, 50 divided by three and so on. So let's just see what that looks like in the Explorer. Uh, so here you can see, our, so there's our initial buy. We've also got no scaling at that point. And here's our first scale entry, and we've got 50% of our position. Second scale entry, 25. Third scale entry, 16. And if we go to a month that had a fourth one, yeah, we'll get an even smaller number here at 12.5. So, so this is the classic pyramiding, as it would be called, where you, you know, you build a you you build a, a solid base, if you like, at your, at your initial entry, and then as the as the pyramid. Um, uh, as the position increases uh, in your favor, you're adding positions, but you're you're getting smaller each time in a, in a sort of pyramid uh, fashion. So if we run that uh, through the, the detailed log, uh, here you'll see the first position uh, is 137, and the second one here is uh, it's 50% of what the position's worth at the time. So um, so remember that. Uh, it's it calculates it on a bar by bar basis, so it's gone. Uh, it's using a value of sixty eight uh, shares here, uh, giving it you know a market value that's gone from roughly fifty grand to about seventy six. So that's that's about right. So we've got, we've increased the size of the position by twenty five percent, and then the next uh, one is um, going to be half again. Oh, not quite half again. Sorry, it's. Um, uh, well, it's used 51 here, and now we've got you know market value, which is up at 95. So, um, yeah, so that's that's how we can do it with with uh, uh, using something which is based on the number of times you scale in, rather than just a, a basic uh, you know flat rate uh, of increase or decrease. Okay, so that's that's basic. That's the basics of scaling, and it doesn't really get any more complicated than that. Uh, it's really up to you how you generate the signals and when you scale in. So you know, if you think about a breakout si uh, system, you might scale in every you know five percent. It goes in your favor, say something like that. Or um, if you think about a mean revert strategy, you may want to scale in you know every time the price decreases by 1% so that you're building a larger position at a better uh, price before it actually reverts. Um, and you also want to have a think about, you know, the, the, the structure of the sizes of those scales, whether, you know, whether you have your biggest uh, scale in last or you have the, the biggest uh, scale in first and you get decreasing in size. So there's two ways to do it. That's sort of the pyramid shape or the inverse pyramid, uh, if you like. And we'll have a look at a, 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 a real world example of that um, uh, in, in, uh, later in the presentation. OK, so uh, no, what's happened to my slides? There we go. So uh, next, scaling out. So this is the one that trips up everybody who first tries to do scaling out. Uh, now, the obvious uh, thing that you would think of is, okay, I'm scammed. when I'm scaling in, I'm on the buy side, I'm buying a position. When I'm scaling out, surely what I want to do is uh, sell some of that position. Uh, which is which is right logically, but the way the Emmy broker works is not always uh, correct logically. And as you can see here, what we actually want to do, all the scaling always happens on the buy side. So we're we're 
buying a position we're increasing it on the buy side and when we want to decrease the position we also will do that on the buy side so it's uh, it's a real gotcha but it's uh, but it's an easy mistake to make and you'll be you know tearing your hair out wondering why it's not working if you go with this uh, first method uh, luckily the uh, the help is uh, very good and is quite uh, clear on that uh, if I can call that up here for you yeah so this is I've got a link to this uh, later in the presentation but um, you can see here it's quite clear that the sig scale in and sig scale out both work on the buy side so uh, so you always refer to the help and you won't go far wrong okay so let's have a look at how scaling out works So here is my scale out. So I've got it on the buy side, not on the sell side. And this time our position size, what we're gonna do is we're gonna buy at 50% and then each time we hit the scale out signal, we're gonna uh, sell down 10% uh, of our equity. Okay, so if we've got you know a 50% position size, the first scale out will bring us down to 40%. Next scale out will bring us down to 30%. It won't be exactly that because the equity will move, but um, you get the idea. So let's have a look at how that works in practice. So first to the explore. So interestingly, what you might observe here is that the signal, the value of SIG scale out is just very slightly different from the value for SIG scale in. So it's 99999, and if you recall, the scale in signal was 99998. So uh, that's that's the way that uh, they've designed it uh, to, uh, I guess, be numbers that you're never gonna use in practicality. You can, you can actually apply your own values to the buy array. Uh, that's something I've done from time to time. You might, you know, so that you can identify different entry signals. If you've got multiple entry signals, you might wanna call the first one 10, the second one's 20 and so on. Uh, you just have to be careful. You're never gonna run into these ones because if I, if I here in this, if I just did nine 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 nine, then that that's basically the equivalent of six scale out. It's exactly the same. So you just have to be careful that you don't reuse that number uh, inadvertently. But you're unlikely to, which is uh, guess why they've set it so high. So uh, so when the backtester sees a one, it's going to buy an, a new entry. When it sees a nine 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 nine, it's going to um, uh, do a scale out. Okay, so let's have a look at the trade list, what that looks like. So this time what you can observe hopefully here is that the scale out column, uh, sorry, the, the scale in scale out column now has the numbers on the right hand side of the slash indicating that these trades are being scaled out uh, and the zero on the left means that there's no scaling in taking place. So um, amazing 83% win rate, which is nice. Um, so that's that's one of the benefits of you know scaling your positions out is that you can actually bank your profits um, uh, and take money off the table as it were as the as the um, risk increases. So um, so that's the first thing to observe. The other thing to observe is that we've got these uh, strange issue with the pricing, but this time it's on the exit side. So if we look at the chart, so if we have a look here at the 31st of December last year, which is this bar here, we can see the closing price was 473.48, but actually our exit price here in the trade list is 464.70. So, you know, quite a bit different. And again, that's because of the averaging effect of those uh, four scale outs on the position. It's given us the final average price as the trade exits, not the actual exit execution price. But once again, we can actually get that from the detailed log. Let's jump on there. If we look down 
here's our final exit here and it is that 473 48 so it did exit at the you know the price expected but the price showing on the trade list is uh, is not not equivalent the other thing on the um when dealing with scale out that you will notice is the position value column now here you can see you know we're in, we've got 100,000 float and we're entering at 50% of that initially so you you know normally you would expect to see that the for at least the first trade more or less about 50 grand but it's obviously it's only 20 and the reason for that is because of those uh, scale outs so the position value is showing us the final position the the value of the position when it was finally sold not the um not the initial entry uh, or the initial value of the position and you can see here when we get four scale outs it's worth it's worth even less in the end so again just bear that in mind that it, um, it can trip you up if you're if you're wondering where where all the capital's gone well that's the reason so yeah we've had a look at those items so let's have a look at varying the scale out size so here we are going to uh, do apply that a very similar approach that we did um, for the scale inside but here we're going to actually uh, decrease the fraction of the remaining position size so remember when you use this sps percent of position each time you do a scale you're actually looking at what the values of that position is worth at that time so when you start with 50 percent and you scale out 50 percent you might be down to 25 but the next time you do a scale out even if it was at the same amount, it wouldn't necessarily mean you would go from 25 to 12 and a half. It would be some other value because because you're looking at a smaller value of the position um, at that point. So let's have a look at that practically. Uh, number five. So uh, yeah, so here we are. So yeah, just bear in mind it's the value of the remaining position size at the point of each scale. So let's have a look at the explore for that. So here we go. So uh, scaling out, yeah, so it's as before, 50, 25, 16, et cetera, et cetera. And if we look at the, well, let's have a look at the trade loss quickly, yep. Okay, so same similar scale outs. Uh, what we should see is we'll have a different profit value at the end. So 7% on the new one and 8.8% .8 on the, uh, the previous one. And if we have a look at the detailed log, what we'll see is, yeah, so 137 here, uh, then we're scaling out um, at half the value of the, Thing when we get here so 68 shares uh, and then you see the next one 17 so far far less far less than 50 percent of this well it's actually 25 percent of um of this one so um yeah and then eight at the last one here it's before the final exit so that's a way you can decrease the size of your position as you go now now remember you may you may want to do it the other way around you may want to invert that and say okay well i'm going to take off a small amount first and then as it increasingly goes in my favor i'm going to take out bigger and bigger amounts until i've got almost nothing left on the position when the risk is at its greatest um uh, yeah and you can also do that you know if you on your if you decide on your losing positions that you want to you know reduce the position size as it goes against you you can also do that as well so um you know you can detect the p l of the position and then you can um uh, work out you know wh wh what a scale to apply so that's obviously going to be a little bit more complex you're gonna to have to use looping or the custom back tester at that point but but in terms of the um simple scaling in scaling out using adjusting position size that's really the um that's it in a nutshell in in terms of the regular code so six scale in six six scale in six scale out to identify the the bars that you want to actually do the scaling on and then some combination of 
percent of equity, percent of position, and no change uh, in terms of the the position sizing for the scale ins and scale outs. And once again, the the, the help page is actually uh, quite useful. It does go into a little bit detail. And here is a a looping example, which I'll uh, I'll leave you to to look at at your leisure. Um, yeah. So that's uh, that's the help. Okay, back to the slides. Okay, so let's have a look now at the custom backtester. So when would you need to use the custom backtester? Well, you need to use the custom backtester as I indicated a moment ago, if you need to have some uh, idea of what the position's doing at the time uh, in terms of its, you know, either its profitability or its size or the prevailing equity while the backtester's running. Um, and you want to use that as inputs to be able to uh, scale your positions. Now, the most obvious um, example of that is rebalancing open positions where you may have a small portfolio uh, or a large portfolio for that matter, it doesn't really matter, but a portfolio of holdings um, that you want to reset their values off on a periodic basis. So again, once a month, once a quarter, once a day, if you're trading at that time scale, you can use some values. Now that may be the initial values you started with, or it may be inputs from some other uh, function that gives you some uh, v um, percentage levels that you want to set the uh, the positions to. And then you use a combination of uh, scaling in and scaling out to realign those positions. Now, the if you're familiar with the custom back tester, uh, it's got a high level, medium level, uh, mid level and low level interface. And for scaling, you all you really need is the mid level CBT because you're not really going to, you're not really wanting to, um, you know, enter it or exit positions using anything uh, other than the way that they got in and out in the regular code. And you want to, uh, so you don't need the low level. And the high level is too high because you actually need to get in and manipulate the trades on a bar by bar basis. So mid level is is where it's at for uh, rebalancing. And the other thing to bear in mind, this is something else that can trip you up as well if you haven't come across it before, is if you if you're deploying the full amount of your capital, you will come up against capital constraints if you try and do um, the rebalancing all in one go, because um, some positions, you, you basically by rebalancing, what you're doing is you're taking money from positions that are more profitable, and then you're applying it to positions that have been losing in that last period. So uh, you can't scale up the losing positions until you've cashed out some of the capital from the, the winning positions. And, you know, just think that in the real world, of course, that's that's the way you would have to do it. You'd have to sell down some of your holdings and then use that spare cash now to scale up your, your other holdings. And it's the same in the custom back tester. If you don't uh, take note of that, you will end up with, uh, you know, you'll get errors in the um, detailed log that tell you it couldn't scale up positions because uh, it didn't have enough capital or your capital is at zero. So it's always best in my experience to do it in two separate stages. You scale the uh, positions that are too big down and then you scale the positions that are too small up and you do that in, in two, uh, two different grabs. So just uh, before I actually show you my example, this there is a good example on the um, uh, the knowledge base of how to do this, but the, in, in my view, the the um, the problem with this is that it does it all in one go. And if you've got, like as I, as I just indicated, if you're using the full amount of your capital and you're scaling um, positions both up and down, you'll be, depend on what order they they happen to be in in the um, back tester, that's going to uh, trip you up. So with that said, now that is a, you know, I can see why they've done it this way because it's, you know, it's a simple example for people who are learning and they don't want to make it too complicated. So, but uh, we're all grown ups here, so we'll make it a little bit more complicated. Um, so here's an example. So this, this, um, 
this it doesn't really matter what the what the strategy is here it's it's basically a, a long term uh, ETF holding strategy and it um it generates uh generates weights on a, a monthly basis of of how you want the uh, the holdings to uh, to be based on you know um, based on a number of things volatility correlation and so on uh, but the, the end result is that we have a weight that we want to apply to each position, that weight being, you know, a percentage of uh, our total capital. Um, and so here we are in the custom back tester. We're using the mid-level back tester. So we, you know, we, we always start with a pre-process and then we um, set up a loop of the bars um, so that we go along um, bar by bar and do our, uh, our uh, rebalancing. The process trade signals is the uh, command or the function used to tell the mid-level back tester to actually process the signals for that bar. So that's going to execute any entries or exits that need to be done at that point. Uh, now, you may have to think about where you place this. You, you may want to place it at the start or at the end of this process. Um, depending on on uh, on how you're doing it, I've got it at the start, so it's going to do the entries and exits, and then if there's any uh, trades remaining, they will then be rebalanced. Uh, if it's a rebalancing day, so I've got something on my code that sets the rebalance day to um, the end of the month. So if it is that particular day, then we first work out what the what the value of the current equity is because that's going to be used to generate the values of the of the trades as they are um, as we want them and then the first thing we do is our our scale outs uh, so let me just jump back to the slides first quickly so the key function that we use to do scaling in the uh, custom back tester is the scale trade function and as you can see it takes the input of the, the bar number the symbol and then this uh, boolean variable which is either going to be true or false indicating whether we want to increase or decrease the position so you can see here in these examples when i'm scaling in i set that to true and when i'm scaling out i set that to false so that's essentially the the main difference between the two uh, different sets of uh, scaling <clears throat> so for my scaling out here's my scale trade with it set to false and then here's my scale in with it set to true now the the rest of the code is is more or less identical um in fact it could be functionized it's um it's it's you know we've got a lot of duplication in here but for the sake of demonstration this this lays it out so that you can see it quite um clearly <clears throat> excuse me um so we first uh, calculate what the uh, desired value of the position is that we want. So we've got our, our weight coming from this static variable and we apply it to the current equity. Um, and then we work out, well, what's the, the next thing to do is work out what the current value of the position is, which we can get from this get position value uh, function. We work out what percentage of the equity that is, and then we work out the difference between those two things. So that difference will tell us if it's below weight or above weight, and then we can use that as a as a way to actually uh, perform the uh, the uh, the scaling. So the number of shares that we're going to buy or sell is is obviously dictated by the um, the value divided by the price. So here we've got. Um, just a, a condition to say whether we actually want to go ahead with the scaling or not so obviously the the difference that we're looking for in value has to be above the price so that we can trade at least one share in it um, in this case it has to be above zero indicating that this is a scale out uh, down here our difference is below zero indicating it's a scale in and then the other thing I've done here is I've created a threshold. So when you're rebalancing positions, obviously that can get quite costly if you're, you know, just buying a few shares here and there every month. So you can have a threshold whereby you do not do the scaling if it's above or below a certain um, percentage of your uh, total equity. So, um, so I'll show you how that works in a minute. Then we do our scale outs. So we go um, around the, the trade list until we find all the uh, trades that are overweight and we scale out, scale out, scale out, scale out, leaving the ones that are underweight intact. Then we do the whole thing again, back through the trade loop. 
uh, do the same same calculations, but this time working out which trades are underweight, and then we want to scale those ones uh, up. So uh, hopefully that makes a reasonable amount of sense um, if we have a look at it in practice. So here's a here's what the here's the, my weights just looking at the. Um, uh, the explore output. So, you know, I'm just I'm holding three ETFs. These are the weights that I want for this particular coming month. So I need to look at how these compare to the uh, the weights that they actually are in terms of their uh, current um, equity. And if I run the um, custom back tester, here right at the end is an example. So the last bar happens to be the last trading day of last month. And you can see here, because I put in these uh, raw trade output uh, commands, now you can you can use a lot people, some people prefer using trace for this. I prefer to have it all inside the detailed log, just so it's easier to, um, to look at uh, in place on each bar. So if you have a look at the, uh, so if you use tra raw trade text output, it will actually put output the text of anything you want basically in the place uh, that it's in the bar where you're expecting it to see. So, excuse me. So you can see for this first one here, this VTI position, the current weight is 26.64 and I actually want that to be 26.43. Uh, the values are there. And so there, there's what it does. It scales out four shares from um, uh, from whatever it was before, from 550 down to 546. So that's the scale out. And then here GLD is also overweight. It wants, uh, it's 40.3%. It wants to be 39.97. So it needs a scale out and it's gone from 975 down 10 to 965. Then we get the second loop and TLT is needs to be scaled up from 32 to 33. Uh, making it a scaling of 22 shares from 1170, 11.77 up to 11.99. So that's the way your rebalancing works. And now the, the trades are all at the correct weights and they can you know go forward for the next month. Um, now, uh, what was what was I going to say next? That's <laughs> lost my train of thought. Uh, Oh yes, yeah. I was going to show you the um, uh, the rebalance threshold. So at the moment, my rebalance threshold is set to zero, which means you know do do, do everything, always always rebalance. So if I do, uh, if I set that to one, that's going to make the rebalance threshold one percent, which means that if the we rebalance is below one percent, as it is in this example, then it will not um, rebalance that. So we should hopefully see if I run this again. Yeah, so now we've got the GLD uh, rebalance and we've got the TLT rebalance, but we don't have the, the VTI rebalance. So that's how you can use the 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 threshold to, to either eliminate or or otherwise your um, your scales. Okay, right. Uh, Graham says if the applied backtest mode important when scaling backtest regular raw. Um, that's a good question, Graham. Uh, la, 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 la. No, it should not be. Um, Backtest regular raw is going to include your um, all the additional buy signals so that you can reuse them in the back test, the custom back test, but it won't affect the scales. The, sc the, sc the scales are separate from that. So I don't think it does matter. But um, yeah, you, you could probably prove me wrong on that one. Uh, okay, right. So that's scaling in the custom back tester. And if that hasn't blown your mind too much, then I think we'll get to the guts of the presentation now, which is the $64,000 question. Does this damn thing actually work? You know, is it worth going to all this hassle? And the answer is, it depends. It really depends on what your goal is. You know, what is it that you're actually trying to achieve by scaling? And always bear in mind, there's no free lunch, you know? So whatever it is that you're trying to in, in try to improve, that's always gonna come at a cost. 
uh, and it just depends whether that cost is uh, higher or lower than the benefit that you're aiming to uh, receive. So, um, so you know, it always may look good on paper, but it's not really until you get into the testing that you can uh, often come um, <laughs> to, to yeah, and Dave says, yeah, of course it depends. Okay, so let's have a look at some examples. Uh, dollar cost averaging. So here we're increasing our long side position size as the market goes against us, uh, anticipating that eventually the market will increase in price and we'll have a, a far better um, average price. Or the inverse, where we're increasing our size as the market goes up. Uh, hoping that the mar or shorting the market as it goes up, but with increasing size, hoping that it will fall and we'll get a better average price on the short side. So the goal obviously is to try and gain some better average price. And you know, this is the so-called buying the dip strategy. You know, it's very very popular out there. A lot of um, lost long-term investors uh, quite like it. Uh, you're also aiming or one of the aims is to actually get a lower drawdown at the early part of the trade. So if you can imagine a mean revert types trade, the, the market's falling uh, after you enter, then you're, uh, you're aiming to increase your size as it goes down against you, hoping that you're gonna be uh, closer to the point where it bounces and then you'll get uh, paid for, for all those uh, entries at a better average price. So what's the cost of that? Well, um, what, one issue is that you may end up with uh, far less exposure than, than you actually want to achieve. So you may have, um, you may anticipate that you want to get four or five scale ins as the price goes against you, but you may only get one or two of them in before the, before the thing goes in your favor. Uh, so now you're you're left with less exposure than if you just jumped in with 100% with at the start of the, the trade. And, you know, ultimately what you're trying to do is lower your overall risk. But just remember that low overall risk usually equals uh, lower, uh, lower profit. Um, so, you know, trying to try and reduce your volatility of returns is going to um, reduce your uh, overall profit normally, normally. Uh, pyramiding, where we're increasing our long position as it goes in our favor. So as the price rises, we're adding to our position. So this is the the turtles. Uh, we're uh, big big fans of um, of this strategy. Um, so the goal obviously is to lower your risk. So if you think about uh, low um, low payoffs or low win rate strategies, such as um, uh, long term breakout trades, those kinds of things, or um, you know. Uh, buying value stocks those kinds of things they're the they're they've got generally a very low uh, rate of win um you know if you think of you know buying penny stocks and those kinds of things so what you're trying to do is you're lowering your risk at the early part of the trade by just having a small bet on and then as it goes in your favor you're you're increasing your position size so you're trying to lower your risk basically but also trying to compound your profits because as it goes in your favor you'll have um, profit on, sitting on the table, which you can uh, um, effectively uh, reinvest, uh, well, especially if you've got access to leverage as well. The downside, of course, is that your your average entry price is getting worse and worse. And of course, the indicator, the, the AMI broker trade list would, would show you exactly that. And that you're, you know, you've, you're, if you get a winning trade, you're going to have a worse uh, profit outcome than had you just jumped in with the full position size at the start of the trade so that's the that's the pay that's the trade-off there uh, for rebalancing here we're periodically aligning our positions so the goal uh, generally is lower volatility of returns this is used a lot on the uh, in the professional investment side of the industry hedge funds are very big fans of this um, approach and the goal is to lower the volatility of returns. You don't want you don't want one or two stocks. If you're holding twenty stocks, you don't want one or two stocks driving the whole the whole portfolio just because they managed to have, you know, made huge amounts of profits and then they start, you know, zigzagging around wildly. That's going to affect the volatility of returns. So they they try and decrease that by um, by rebalancing periodically. 
of course, what you're doing is you're you're removing profit from the better performers and you're apply, applying it to the worst performers. Uh, generally, if we're talking about, if you think of something like a rotational strategy, your best returns are actually going to come from your more volatile stocks. Of course, it adds to the volatility of your returns, but if you rebalance, then you've got to accept that your lower volatility or returns will result in a lower overall return. So that's the cost of you know, doing business, if you like, you're trying to buy uh, lower uh, risk and lower volatility with uh, with giving some of your profit back. And finally, profit taking. So here we're scaling out of a position as it goes in our favor. So the idea is that we try and bank our profits uh, before the trade turns against you. This is the classic um, um, uh, what do they call it now? So yeah, sell your sell your winners early and let your losers run. So this is the classic, you know, beginners um, thing where you know as soon as the trade goes in their favor, they start banking the profits um, because they're worried about it's going to go against you. Meanwhile, they're holding on to their losers because they're hoping that they'll eventually come back. So that's effectively what we're doing here. We're trying to bank our profits before the trade turns against us. Uh, we're trying to reduce that risk in the later part of the trade. So if, especially, you know, a, a trending trade, if we've been in the trade a long time, the higher it's gone, the you know, the higher it has to fall to hit our exit point. Uh, so we're going to, um, we're at the maximum risk at that point. And so if we take profits, uh, we're going to reduce that risk. Uh, of course, the downside is the trade keeps going without us and uh, we've left money on the table uh, and generally it's the same thing again with the others but we're trying to reduce risk and and the cost of that is is less overall return in the end so let's have a look at uh, a practical example of that just before we uh, wind things up um, we'll use uh, Connors's TPS strategy which is basically a dollar cost uh, averaging mean revert strategy. Some of you may be familiar with it already. The code is readily available in the um, Ami Broker knowledge base, and I will post a link to that at the end of the um, presentation. Well, it's actually in the presentation notes, uh, which I'm happy to share the slides and uh, all the code snippets and what have you can uh, are, are, uh, will be available. I'll, I'll pass them all to, to Dave to post on the forum. Uh, but here we're um, we're going to trade the S&P 500 uh, ETF uh, when it's above its 200 day moving average. We're going to wait for the RSI to go below 25, so oversold, and then we're going to uh, enter at a 10% uh, position size. When if the if the if we che then check the closing price of each bar following that initial entry, and if the closing price dips below the price that, of our initial entry, then we buy another twenty percent. If it dips below again that second entry price, then we buy another thirty percent, and then if we get a, a chance and it dips below that third entry price, we buy forty percent. So forty plus thirty plus twenty plus ten obviously gives us a, a hundred percent of our ultimate position size. So that's what we're trying to do. And we're as as the market falls each time, we're going to get uh, a bigger chunk of our position on it, a far better price. So we'll end up with an excellent. Um, uh, uh, average price if we're able to get all of the the um, the, the scales in uh, before the market turns and, and goes in our favor and that's that's the that's the key to this strategy and then the exit's just overbought basically when the RSI goes overbought above 70. So let's have a look at how that works in practice. Here is the code which is available online. I'll just take out this section here so it's more or less the way it was. Um, so uh, we've got our capital, we've got one single position and we're gonna do, um, here I've, I'm setting the position size to, yeah. So the position size is 100 divided by one, so 100% and uh, the, I won't go through all the code in detail because I'm sure most of you can read it perfectly fine. Uh, but here's our scaling uh, parameters. First scaling is 0.1 or 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%. It does all the calculations of where those entry points are. And then here actually does the, there's the, there's the buy um, 
array which which may look familiar to you because it's just that you know buying on the first one and then all the others are sig scale in and the position size is calculated based on that you know the, the values of those parameters and which of the triggers was um, triggered at that point so um, yeah so let's have a look at it in practice uh, let's just send it to the vec tester Connors TDS, here we are. So, go back to the trade list. So here you can see um, it's the series of trades uh, back in 2021, amazing uh, win rate, 92%, 90, almost 93% win rate, only one loser basically in the whole year, which was a small loser. So, so it makes money. 3% with a 2.84, so the you know, car MDD above one, which is good. And you can see here the scales. So the scaled in uh, once on that first position, second position didn't at all, only managed to get in the entry, no scales on top of that. Same with that one. <clears throat> Down here, we had three scales, so we got all of them on that one. You can see here our position values at its maximum, 101. And um, <clears throat> here we managed two and got up to 60% of our size on um, before the thing turned and went in our favor. Uh, so that all looks great. Massive win rate, uh, low risk, um, good return, and very low, low volatility of return as well. Uh, the exposure value on that is 5.7%. So it's a, it's a decent set of numbers. Here's the uh, here's what the report looks like. What's the sharp ratio on it? Ten point eight percent sharp ratio, right? So you can run off and start your own hedge fund with uh, with this particular um, uh, strategy. Uh, however, however, as we've seen, where there is a benefit, there is also a cost, and our cost here is that we're probably leaving money on the table because we're our exposure is very low so 5.7 percent okay so that's that's tiny which is given us a low low rate a low risk low risk of drawdown and a very high sharp ratio and so on um but you know are we in this game to make low volatility returns or are we in this game to to make money so what's the alternative well if we have a look at the alternative Rather than scaling in 10, 20, 30, 40%, what happens if we just jump in and put 100% on the very first scale? So first scale is one, all the others are zero. So we're basically buying a full position size at the outset and we're not doing any scaling at all. So let's have a look at the difference. So bear in mind, we had 3% return per annum on this example here. And if I run this one, well, now it jumps up to 20% and the, the drawdown is actually hardly moved. Um, and our win rate's a measly 85% this time. Um, but here you can see, you know, our full position size is on every trade. Zero, no scaling at all because our, our, our scales were all zero. Uh, but our returns are much, much bigger. And if I just call up the report for that. So you can see the main difference is our exposure. It's now 17, so it's three times as much. Um, our return, uh, our annual return is, you know, seven, seven times, let's call it. Uh, not really much change to the win rate, uh, not much change to the drawdown. Um, uh, our sharp ratio has reduced. It's only 7% instead of 10% now, so uh, not percent seven instead of ten I should say uh, but um, uh, but you can see that you know far better results in terms of the profitability anyway not not everyone not every metric has actually gone in our favor but um, but that you know and there's obviously different permutations that you could have of this you could have um, well let's just try it here let's go 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 so 50 percent plus 50 percent so we're only doing one scale each time if we can get it on. And you can see, yeah, the, re the return's not as good. It's The results are probably going to end up some somewhere in the middle. Halfway house, yeah, 12%, 3%. Sharp ratio is <clears throat> 8, so not quite as good, yeah. 
uh, not quite as good as the initial one, but slightly better than the than the second one. So, so you can obviously play with these numbers. You can even run an optimization if you want and find out what the best scaling option is. But for something like this, as you can see, you're probably better having the bigger part of the scaling up front and then the smaller part of the scaling last as the as the price goes down. Given the fact that you may not, may not actually achieve all of the scales that you wanted. Okay, so uh, that brings us close to the end here. I've got some links here just showing the uh, the various bits of uh, thing I've showed you already, which is the the guide to scaling from the Ami Broker user guide, uh, the scaling examples from the CBT from um, uh, from again from the user guide but uh, from the knowledge base I should say um, uh, but just remember the the um, uh, the issue with that about doing it all in one go rather than doing ins and outs or outs and ins rather and then the TPS if you want to have a play with that uh, strategy you're welcome to and with that I will open the floor for the questions uh, let's see. Scott says, "Can you run this during a bear market or over a longer time uh, uh, time frame?" Yeah, you can. You can. You can. You can. You can do whatever you want with that uh, if you like. Uh, you will find during a bear market. If I go back two thousand seven, let's say. So you'll find during a bear market, or it's 2008, here it is here. Oh, well, we're not gonna get very many signals because of the 200 day moving average being the, the, the trend filter. Uh, but you will find, let's just look at the scaling column. Uh, so, you know, you can pick out some dates here. 2019, that was a big um, correction in the market. 2007, obviously, um, had its moments. Uh, 2014, difficult to remember that far back but uh, there's 2018 in there so some of these dates will be um, uh, familiar to you and obviously the bigger the fall in the market the more chance a strategy like this is going to actually do to, to scales uh, the Larry says the one issue is using uh, zero uh, trade delays with this yeah yeah that's uh, let's see uh, well, it's not set in the code actually so yeah so it would depend what you've got set here I think I've got mine set to zero yeah so yeah if you're buying on the close yeah, you have to be able to anticipate that there are techniques to do that um, uh, Howard Bandy's book uh, quantitative technical analysis is a good example of how you can anticipate uh, the price the RSI has to get to to uh, generate uh, a trading signal so you can you can there are ways to to actually do that and then you can use limit on close or market on close orders uh, if you want to try and achieve that but yeah you may want to look at trading the following days uh, open or 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 indeed using limit orders uh, to to get in rather than um, executing at the uh, open or the close yeah good one Larry okay you can uh, get a hold of me at uh, Alan at helix trader com or catch me on the website or catch me on uh, Twitter um, all right well if there's no more questions uh, thank you very much for your time uh, wish you good luck, good trading, and uh, back to you, Dave.